Thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us today. Yay! Hi, Hello. Joe. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm glad it finally connected. Uh, Joe, yeah. we have uh, quite a captive audience. Some are here just to see you. And um, thank you again for being our guest today. And I've had a question from the very first time I interacted with you a few minutes ago. Can you see me okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone wanted to know, did you lose a bet <laughs> with your hair? Uh, um, no, no. So I, um, so I turned 50 back in January, and um, several months before that, my, my wife had come back from, uh, from a haircut with a little streak of blue in her hair. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. And she's like, you know, you ought to consider doing something. I'm like, hmm, well, I really do like purple. Maybe when I turn 50, I'll, I'll have my hair dyed purple just to sell Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically self-employed. I work at home. I'm allowed to do whatever I want with my hair. And uh, so I just thought it would be fun. So I did that, but that was six months ago. And hang on a second. My cat is trying to break into my office here. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> and... Um, and I, I, I got so many compliments on it, I, I, I just thought, well, you know, I'll keep it going for a little while. Um, it won't always be purple. Uh, someday it'll go back to being sort of, you know, this color here. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, when, when people say, what's with the hair? I like saying, well, you know, as we get older, our hair often changes color. You, you wake up one day, it's a little different from what you remember, and um, draw whatever conclusions you like. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you. Um, I, I was in Detroit uh, for one of your meetings, like, in maybe, I don't know, 1994 or something, a really long time ago. Um, so perhaps uh, there might be one or two people uh, here today who were also here then. I have no idea. Uh, but anyway, it was lovely to be there in person. It's, it's also lovely to be uh, there with you virtually today. So I, uh, I have written books for 20 odd years now. I've written more than 60 books, uh, most of them having to do with Apple stuff in some way. Um, this book is a little bit different um, in that it, I mean, first of all, it's not just about Apple stuff. It's, it's applicable to everyone. Um, but also it's not so much of a, uh, really nuts and bolts how to it's it's a little bit higher level so you know as as I was sort of getting close to 50 I you know thinking more about like grown-up things you know like wills and like I don't want to be morbid here because like I, I think of all the books you might read this year about death mine will definitely be the most fun um so but it's not it's not really about like oh you know that, but it's more, you know, for me, it's more of a positive, hopeful thing. You know, I think back about, so my, on, on my, on my mom's side of the family, uh, people were really, really good about keeping genealogical records, but on my dad's side of the family, hardly at all. So like my grandfather, my dad's dad died a couple of months before I was born. And I've seen, you know, a few pictures of him. I've heard a few stories, but I, I know almost nothing about his life. His father, my my great sorry my my great grandfather on my dad's side, I know his name, I know his date of birth and date of death, but that's about it. Um, and and nobody in the family seemingly ever cared about telling stories about him or keeping records or, or anything. It's been really really difficult to find out anything about this guy's life, to to say nothing of like older generations in that family, and that really bums me out. Um, I don't want I don't want my children, grandchildren, great grandchildren to be wondering, well, I, I think you know our great granddad was maybe named Joe, but what was he like? Well, you know, the computer that I'm standing in front of right now has like thousands and thousands of pictures of me. It has hours and hours of video that has been recorded like like this. It has books that I've written. It has hundreds of thousands of email messages that I've exchanged. It has like calendars going back for years. It has all this stuff about me. And I sure wish that uh, I had this sort of information about my grandparents, great grandparents, you know, 
obviously that was the pre-digital world. But nowadays, all this stuff is digital, and I can preserve that for my kids and grandkids and future generations. The only thing is, it's not going to happen automatically. This, the fact that this stuff is on my computer now does not guarantee that it's still going to be around or usable or findable, whatever, 50, 100 years from now. So uh, so that's kind of part of it, my, my realizing that I want to pass this on. But another part is... I do a lot of user group meetings like this one, and I'll do you know I'll do a, a meeting about you know passwords or something, and people will come up to me after the meeting and say, "Well, that was really cool. Thank you for sharing that." But you know, like I'm 89, and realistically, I don't have that much longer left, and I really want to make sure that my kids have access to my passwords so they can get into my accounts and deal with the stuff that needs to be dealt with. So. Uh, great that you tell me what to do, but I also need you to tell me what to tell my kids to do, that kind of thing. So I started getting a lot of uh, comments along those lines about, like, how, what do I do with my digital stuff when I want to pass it on to other people? So so that that's kind of what this book is about. This book is about taking all of the digital parts of your life, your email, your photos, your, uh, you know, your your movies, your social media accounts, like this, your scan documents, all these different kinds of things, figuring out what you want to preserve, how you want to preserve it, who you want to pass it on to, and, and sort of setting up a system that you can use to make sure that the, the bits of this that you want to, to, to be preserved in the future are preserved in the way you want them to be. Because if you don't do these things, then you, you, you kind of take what you get, you know, your, your children or grandchildren or friends or other family members might not preserve the kind of data that you would like them to. They might not remember you the way you would like them to. So this is all about kind of um, dealing with that stuff now while you are able. Now, uh, a lot of you probably have ordinary wills, you know, you maybe you went to a, a lawyer or an estate planner, or maybe you just like filled out a form online and went sort of the cheap route. And you have this, this document that says, okay, well, when I die, I want to leave, you know, my car to my son and my house to my daughter and my, you know, empty bank account to, you know, whoever. And, and that's great. And, and, you know, everybody should do that. Everybody should do sort of ordinary estate planning. It's it, if you haven't done it, I mean, like I, I recognize it can be kind of intimidating it can be kind of expensive. It's like it's like a not a not a fun thing to do. <laughs> but the thing is, whether you've done that or not, very often that sort of estate planning leaves out all the digital stuff or sort of yada yadas it. Um, your will might not say a whole lot, if anything, about your digital photos, the stuff on your hard drive, your email, your you know social media accounts, all that stuff. So the purpose of this book is to, to tell you how to deal with all of all of that stuff. And um, this, th you know, think of this as being in addition to your will. So this is not like, you know, the, the book is pretty cheap and you'll get a, a discount, a further discount because you're user group members. Um, and you might, it, it might end up that you want to pay, like buy an external hard drive or like pay a little extra money to store some of this stuff. We'll get to that later. But um, but this is more or less something that you can do for free. This is this is going to take some time to to gather this stuff together, but it really doesn't cost anything. And then this is sort of you're going to make a like make a little dossier existing will, if any. You can do this even if you don't have an ordinary will. Um, but the idea is your will is for sort of like, you know, your physical possessions and your money. And and what we're going to be talking about today is kind of your digital will, the, the will that has to do with all of your digital stuff. So um, I, I if I had been able to share my screen, I Oh, sorry, you have a question, Sheila? I have a, I have a comment because you, yeah, yeah. you mentioned how that this won't take a lot of time. I mean, it will take some time. Yeah, As yeah. I read your book, I did the steps that, you know, you were saying that we could do or asking about. And it yep. doesn't take as long as you might think. 
I, I want to put that in there. It was actually, okay. I found myself running back and forth from reading the book, running to my computer to make sure that I had this done. Or did I have that? Okay. So it actually took a far less time than I thought it would. So I just wanted to throw that in there. So oh, okay. sorry. I, I, that's, that's totally fine. I mean, I think the, the thing I would say is like it all depends. Um, it depends partly on how organized you are already. Um, and like a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today are, you know, things that a lot of people have already done. And so you just maybe package them up a little bit differently. Um, depending on your situation, if, um, you know, maybe, uh, you're, you're looking at, um, you know, piles and piles of paper or photos that you would really like to scan and digitize and preserve for the future, but you haven't kind of gotten to it yet. So that sort of thing could make it take longer for some people. Um, if, if I were able to share my screen, I'd be showing you, oh, here's the URL to go to, and here's the, the coupon code that you can enter for your discount. I, I assume that you have a means of conveying that to your member. Okay. Uh, yes, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you have that and I, I don't need to show you. Okay, super. Um, I will mention one of the things you're going to get with this book. It's not just the ebook, uh, but it's also this template that you can fill in. You just open it up in your favorite word processor. And it's the template for your digital will. And you can fill in all these different categories. I figured it's much easier to have a starting point than just like a blank sheet of paper. So that's another thing you get. Uh, okay, so as I, as I said before, sort of the, the essence of what we're talking about is the fact that you get to make decisions now about what's gonna happen to your data later on. That's, that's what we're aiming for. Now, of course, one way this is going to help you is like, you know, what your great grandchildren get to see. So that's that's true. Saving your data for posterity is is important, useful and cool. But I also want to back up a little bit. Um, let's say you're hit by a bus tomorrow and um, uh, we'll, we'll miss you and um, we'll, uh, I'll come sing at your funeral and it'll be sad. But, you know, in the aftermath of, of your death, um, your husband, wife, kids, neighbors, whoever are, are going to be wondering about some things. Well, let's see, where is that person's insurance information? Where are their medical records? Where are their financial records? Like, I, oh, I got, people are emailing this person who is now dead. I got to, like, stuff, like, stuff got, has to be taken care of, right? And so your next of kin or whoever is going to be still left is going to have to take care of business. And so part of this is not just for the super long term, it's for the like, you know, immediate kind of postmortem phase. But then also, let's back up even further. It's you're, you're not dead. Thank goodness, you're still alive. You still have many more happy years ahead of you. But yeah, you, maybe you want to go on vacation for a couple of weeks. Or maybe you want to, uh, you know, you, whatever, you, you know, you get sick and you're, you're, you're unable to do your ordinary stuff for a month, whatever, you're either voluntarily or involuntarily, you're just out of commission for a little while. And during that time, uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today that you can do to, to prepare your digital legacy are, are actually going to be super useful, um, like right now. So some of the things that you would do that would be like great for your wife or your husband after you're dead would also be really great for like your house sitter if you leave to go, you know, travel Europe for a month or something. So um, I, I just want to sort of emphasize that it's not just about the distant future and it's not even just about after you're dead. It, it, this is sort of organizational things you can do that will solve some immediate problems as well. And there, there can be a lot of value to your, your friends, family members right now in the, the kinds of information that they can have access to and how they can get at them. So as I was starting to think about this whole process, uh, like, like why, why, isn't it, why isn't it easy? Why, why shouldn't it just be a very straightforward thing? I started realizing that there are certain challenges. Um, and I'll just give you a few examples. The book has lots more examples. So one of the challenges has to do with things like encryption and passwords. So I'm a big fan of using encryption, using great passwords, and you know, really paying attention to your password security. That's super. But if you if you have got all of your like you use File Vault on your Mac, let's say, and you got all your files encrypted, and you have these super duper passwords, 
and the only place those passwords exist is in your head, um, then you're kind of stuck if somebody else needs to get at them. So it, the, the security can kind of work against you. Like there, this, this lock has but one key, and I, oops, I lost. You know, so so the the very the very thing that helps you in some situations can work against you in other situations. Um, that's an that's one example of a, of a challenge. Another example is is file format. So I, I can't see the audience. Uh, Shidi, you can you can tell me how many people raise their hands, but um, how many people here used to use Apple Works? Apple Works, wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, at least. All right. 14, so 15, I, I, or eight. yeah. <laughs> I, I I figured it would be something like that because it always is, and um, and can I just say to those fifteen of you, I am sorry for your loss. Um, so th this this happens, or this happens in the computer world is is we start using some kind of app, we get into it, we create a lot of stuff into it, and then whatever there are some changes in the technology world, and that app goes away. Now, ten or fifteen years later. Not only can you not buy or use that app anymore, it's actually really, really hard to even find some other app that will import those files nowadays. Um, for the, I mean, in some cases, it's easier, some it's harder. But my point is that if you have personally experienced that pain of going through, like you know, whether it's Apple Works or some other app that uh, you you know you used to use, and now like, how do I open these files? This happens all the time, and it's going to happen again in the future. And even the file formats that today we think are really, really common could easily be like, oh, that's something I only ever see in a museum 10 or 20 or 50 years from now. So that's something you really got to pay attention to is, is making your best guess at which file formats I might want to save my data in that will hopefully be more likely to survive. Again, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then there's the actual hardware itself. So um, it's been a long time since Apple sold a floppy drive. And of course, uh, no modern, no, no, none of the Macs that you can buy today even have a CD-ROM drive. So let's say you know you're digging through the attic and you find some old floppy disk, and you're like, oh yeah, this had that thing on it that I made in college or whatever. <sighs> How do I read it? Like just like finding a computer or device that still works that you can put this thing into and get data off of it is really, really hard. And then even if you find the device that you can actually hook up, hook up to the Mac you own today, well, 20 years in an attic, who knows what might have happened to this? I mean, the heat, moisture, rats, like who knows? Like the, the media itself can degrade. And so the same thing is going to happen in the future. Like, well, I've got, hey... I've got this handy, you know, external hard drive, and it, this has all my data on it. Uh, that's super great. I can carry it all in my pocket. But uh, if I put this in the attic for 20 years, there's really no guarantee that that somebody's going to be able to find a connector like this that still works. And even if they do, who knows? Will it still spin up? Will the data still be good? And that's that's a thing that we really need to think about. Another challenge is organization. So. Apple wants you to not really worry about what you name files and photos and where you put them because, hey, we've got Spotlight, right? And so all you got to do is search. The same way, the same story with Gmail. It doesn't matter where you file your email messages. Yeah, I just search. Now, I'm going to just pretend for the sake of argument that Spotlight actually worked, um, which... Okay, like you know, we're, we're 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 it's it's this is fiction. Okay, so we're pretending, okay. but even if Spotlight worked <laughs> the way it was like advertised to, um, there's a little bit of a problem with this, and the the problem is that you have to know what you're looking for. So, as an example, let's say that I I wrote you know a novel. I, I didn't bother telling it. Like it's an unpublished novel. I didn't tell anybody that I wrote it. If I ever want to find that file. Well, I can just do a search on, you know, the name of the file or the maybe, you know, the name of a character in this story. Um, but somebody else who, like, inherits my computer and just says, well, hmm, 
there's a million files on here. I am definitely not going to open every single one of them and figure out what they are. They have no idea that I wrote a novel. They're not going to know what the name of it is. They're not going to know that some, you know, so, some arbitrary name that I chose is in fact this great piece of literature that's just waiting to be published. And so they might never find it. And so the fact that you can find stuff using tools like Spotlight or like Gmail now is not going to help anyone in the future if they don't actually even know what they're searching for. So that's another challenge we have to overcome. So how are we going to overcome this? Well, I told you, you know, this book comes with a template and whether you use that template or, or just a blank sheet of paper, uh, you wanna create a digital will. Ultimately, this digital will is going to be sort of the, it's, it's going to correspond to your ordinary will. It's going to be, this is what I have, and this is who gets it, kind of. Um, so as part of this, you're going to have to have an inventory of your stuff. Now, again, I have more than a million files on my Mac, and I am definitely not going to make a catalog of all million of them and what they are and where they are. That's insane. And look, life is too short. Um, so I don't want you to literally inventory everything. I do want you to have an inventory of sort of the broad categories, the things that are, you know, the broad categories and the things that are most important. So for example, you will have uh, a heading that is here are my online accounts. Now, look, I have more than a thousand online accounts. Again, I'm not going to list all a thousand of them in my digital will because really nobody cares. Um, People will care about, you know, half a dozen of the most important ones. They will care about maybe my Twitter account, Facebook account, my Dropbox account, like whatever. It's going to be a different list for each person. But whichever accounts have the information that is most important to you, the most data stored in them, the stuff that you actually care about, you're going to write down what you have and what's there. Same thing is going to be true of your media. Now, that could be photos that you've purchased. It could be music, TV shows, movies that you've purchased, uh, stuff that you've downloaded that maybe you did not necessarily purchase. Anyway, media that you own um, will, will have to go on this list. Might include software, apps that you've purchased. And then other personal data. Now, I don't mean to sort of downplay this because it's like other and it's the end of the list, but that novel that you wrote, all of you know the, the the papers that you scanned from when you were in college and grad school, all of, I mean, like I have, it, there's a box in my closet here that is like um, memorabilia from everywhere from, from grade school up to grad school. And I have like, you know, papers I wrote in 11th grade. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever even <laughs> get around to scanning them because man, there's a lot. Um, I, I think it's kind of cool. I, I, I imagine that, you know, a great grandchild, a gra great grandchild might someday think that it's cool to see what great, great grandpa Joe, you know, wrote back in 1980s something or other. Uh, I don't know, but, but my point is that however much stuff you have and whatever kind of things you have, um, it could be interesting and important to someone. And so you, you need to sort of look through your stuff, the letters you've written, the art you've created, the music you've created, anything else that's on your computer, your iPad, your, your iPhone, and, and make a list of the things that are particularly important you think somebody else might care about. And then you're going to have to decide, okay, well, look, I, I, I have my broad categories. I have my, my top level list of stuff. Boy, there's a lot here, and I need to decide what I'm going to keep and what I'm going to discard. Now, as I've talked to a lot of people about their digital legacy, um, I've, I've discovered that most people fall into one of two categories. On the one hand, you have pack rats, people who are genetically disposed to just save everything. Now, I, I come from a family of pack rats. Um, my, uh, oh, my, my dad, let me tell you a couple of stories about my dad. Uh, he really liked tools. Um, he also really liked to, to lose tools. So, um, every couple of years around Christmas, my dad would say, you know what, uh, if anybody is needing a, a gift idea for me, I really need a new drill. And we're like, didn't we just get you a drill a couple of years ago? And he'd be like, yeah, but I can't, I can't find it anymore. And then we'd get him a drill and 
then a couple years later be like, you know what I really need is a new drill. Like, what happened to the last drill? So, um, you know, eventually the time came for my parents to move out of their, uh, the home that they'd been in for, you know, 25 years. And I, I, you know, you went to my dad's workshop, which is workbench piled high with all this crap. You start going through it and then, you know, you dig down a layer and like, oh, look, there's a hardly used drill. And then you dig down another foot under all this stuff. And like, oh, look, another hardly used drill. And he had like five drills that were barely used. And he and my mom got into this big kind of argument about how many sledgehammers a family needs to own. Um, my, my mom's opinion was that that number was somewhat less than one uh, in that neither of them were actually physically capable of lifting a sledgehammer. Um, my dad's op opinion was that it was at least two and um, they had this this whole big argument, but but, but I have this, but I, I, it's, a, it's a great sledgehammer. I've owned it for 50 years. You, you really mean I should get rid of this? Anyway, so this is what I, this is what I'm faced with. All right. So my point is, in, in the digital world, there are people like that. Well, yes, I, of course, I, I keep every email message I've ever sent or received. Why wouldn't I? Um, even though I have I have no story at all about why why that would ever be useful. Then, on the other hand, there are people who like to live very minimalist, you know, very very simply. And I, you know, they they use their trash can very freely. I look at a thing and then I'm done with it, and out of sight, out of mind, and don't don't give it another thought. Of course, a lot of us are in somewhere, you know, in that in between continuum. Um, but, but among those people who, who sort of freely delete things are, are those who, um, maybe you're not deleting things for completely capricious reasons. So let's say that, um, you, you have some documents or photographs or emails on your, on your computer that you're not necessarily very proud of. Um, that might be, I don't know, incriminating in some way that you may not want, or I don't know, spouse or children to see. Um, now, I have no judgment about these things. Uh, your your life is your life and your past is your past. But it's a, it's a thing to think about. Is there anything that if, even if I, even if I am a pack rat, <laughs> is there anything on your computer that if you were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, you wouldn't be all that happy for your loved ones to find out about you? So my, my point in all of this is you need to kind of come up with a policy for yourself. And that policy could be anywhere from I want to preserve every digital document, no matter how trivial it may seem, to I want to delete almost everything and pass on as little as possible or anywhere in between. And that decision is totally up to you, but you need to make it. You need to decide how you are going to deal with your data just sort of at a high level, and and what is going to be your policy for what you keep and what you discard. Another super important decision you have to make, one of the most important decisions, is who your digital executor will be. Now, with, with a regular will, you, you have, yes, this is the list of my possessions and who I want to, to give them to. There's also going to be a person who is in charge of carrying out the instructions in your will. You want this to be a person that you trust because this is the person who is going to be sort of have legal authority over your stuff and you want to make sure it gets to the right place. Uh, well, in the digital world, you also need to have a person you trust who is going to make sure that the right people get your digital photos and your email archive and that poetry that you wrote back in the 70s and whatever the stuff is that you want to pass on. This needs to be not only a person you trust, but a person with some digital skills. Now, in an ideal perfect world, this will be the same person as the regular executor for your regular will. That would make things the easiest, the cleanest. But if that person um, does not have, like, you know, can't deal with different file formats, doing password reset requests and doing file conversions and backups and things like that, then maybe you want to enlist someone else a trusted friend, a uh, family member, or colleague who does have those skills, and you say basically you are going to be the person in charge 
uh, carrying out the instructions in my digital will. And of course, this person will have to coordinate with your regular executor. Um, now, in terms of file formats, uh, in my book, I have some lists of, all right, if you're talking about text kinds of documents, here are some good file formats. If you're talking about graphics, video, audio, and so forth, here are sort of the recommended formats. Um, my general advice is if you want to preserve something for the distant future, number one, um, using an open file format is probably a smarter idea than using a proprietary file format. So, for example, um, the you know .txt plain text. Well, that's as, that's as open and generic as you can possibly get. Uh, also .rtf like rich text files. That's an open format. PDFs are an open format. Um, you know PNG graphic files open format. Apple Works. Well, that was proprietary. Uh, even Microsoft's formats like .docx, that's proprietary format. Now, a lot of people use it, that's true. Um, and the, the file format is very well known. I, I'm just saying historically, and if you ask like an archivist or a historian, what, what file formats have the best chance of surviving into the future, they're gonna say ones that are open have the best chance and also ones that do not involve compression. So if you're looking at your, your photos, for example, if you have tens of thousands of JPEGs, as you know I do, um, they would say, well, the thing about JPEGs is that they're compressed. And due to, due to reasons, <laughs> um, compression sort of works against you when you're talking about very long-term viability. Now, you could switch to a format like uncompressed TIFF, and uncompressed TIFF has a much better chance of being viable 100 years from now. Of course, that's also going to mean your photo library that now maybe takes up 50 gigabytes might grow to be terabyte in size. So you've got to weigh that, you know? And maybe the way you solve this is to say, you know, son, um, how much do you love your dad? <laughs> do, you, do you love me enough to go through my photo collection in, let's say, 20 years and convert all of those files to like, some new format. So there, there are like you know, there are creative ways that you can handle this if you don't want to like go through and convert massive amounts of files to another format. You can you can pawn that off on somebody else. You can postpone it. But I'm just saying it's a thing to think about. It's a thing to factor into your planning, and it's a thing to include in your digital will what you would like to have happen to these things in the future. I'm gonna pause, take a little drink. So I mentioned earlier that you might have uh, boxes of papers, like I do. You might have some photographs. Now, um, all, the, all the pictures that I've taken since uh, 2000 and something have been on digital cameras. So those are automatically in digital form. But before I started using a digital camera, I used film cameras. And all the pictures that try that. There we go. Uh, we'll we'll see, how, see how that goes. Okay, thank you. So I, uh, you know, I have a friend who, ha ha who is sort of his family's designated archivist. What this means is all of his family members and relatives gave him all of their paper photographs and not just photos either, but like old documents. This could be, you know, movie tickets from 1947, or it could be, you know, playbills or uh, marriage certificates or like whatever, like any sort of, of paper memorabilia they, they gave to, to my friend Marshall. And he, he has these all sorted by like date and family member in these huge plastic containers. And he just has stacks and stacks and stacks of these plastic containers in his office. There are many tens of thousands of, of pictures and pieces of paper. And his job is to go through all of those, scan them, to catalog them, to share them with his family members. So every year at Christmas time, he sends all of his family members a DVD containing like, you know, a few thousand of the most recent things that he has scanned so that they all have their own copies and they can share them. And, um, and he's been doing this for years and years, and he still has some some distance to go before he has scanned all of these things. 
Now, that's kind of an extreme example, but I'll, I'll bet that many people here do have at least some number of paper, photographs, documents that other family members might really like to see now, <laughs> um, and also certainly you would like to pass on in the future. And of course, it's totally fine to just keep those papers, you know, keep them stored safely, um, and, and you should, but the whole reason we, we all have backups of our Macs is that stuff happens, you know, there's a fire or a flood or whatever, and all those old valuable photographs get, get ruined, um, it would be really nice to at least have digital copies of them. So uh, if, if you've already scanned all of your stuff, then hey, great, you just, you know, you, you add that to your, to your digital legacy and you're good. If you, if you haven't scanned this stuff and you need to, it might be a great idea to invest in a scanner and invest some time or, you know, enlist, uh, you know, child, grandchild, somebody else with, with some time on their hands, maybe, you know, bribe them with cookies or whatever, um, and, uh, and get them to start, start scanning photographs. If it's something that you don't want to do yourself or just don't have time to do yourself, there are companies that'll do it for you. They'll say, hey, no problem. Just send us a box of, of photographs, documents. We'll scan them and then we'll charge you some fee. Maybe it's 30 cents, 50 cents, some some fee per image. Um, if you want to pay us a little bit of extra, maybe we'll do some photo retouching and you know, nicening up. And then we'll either send you a DVD or we'll put the files online or send you a flash drive or like they all do it different ways. But the point is, uh, it is something you can pay somebody else to do if you don't want to do it yourself. But it is a really good idea to, to make sure that your digital legacy includes these things that might still be analog today. Now, um, one of the things that you're going to encounter if you start scanning dozens, hundreds, thousands of photographs is what to name them and how to organize them. And... The complexity of naming and organizing photos has has brought a lot of good people down. <laughs> it's 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 really hard. Uh, now, my friend Jeff Carlson has has written a book on digital photo management, and of course, great great if you want to buy his book, um, and it's, it's really good. But but for for this purpose, in terms of like digital legacy stuff, I'd like to suggest a kind of low tech approach, and this is the approach that, that my friend Marshall takes. So, uh, you know, he has a, has a photograph in his hand. He's just scanned it. Now he's got a file. You know, the scanner is going to give it a file, like, file name, like, you know, img underscore one, two, three dot png or something. Okay. So uh, Marshall's like, well, I'm just going to open a text document, text edit, whatever, any, any old word processor, doesn't matter. I'm going to type in that name that my scanner gave it, img one, two, three dot png, and I'm going to take a tab. I'm going to say, Oh, well, this is Ethel in front of her, you know, uh, condo in Florida in 1964. And he's just going to say any, any person that's in the photograph that he can identify, he'll write that down. Any markings on the back of the photo or any like photographer's stamps, he'll write that down. If he's gotten any clues as to who or what might be in the photo from somebody else, he's going to type in. It could be a few words. It could be a couple sentences, whatever. Um, and then you put that, you know, carefully preserve that photo in a nice, nice you know, uh, you know, plastic envelope or whatever, and then move on to the next one. Um, now, of course, you can get really fancy. You can have databases that you can use, you know, all kinds of tagging and labels and photos or aperture or Lightroom or whatever. It, and that's fine. But the great thing about this low-tech approach is that it's easy. And you can send around this text document to anyone, doesn't matter what software they have, and they can just, you know, hey, Command F, let's search for Aunt Ethel. And they say, oh yeah, Aunt Ethel is in this picture, this picture, this picture. Hey, hey Marshall, can you send me those files? And it's low tech, but it's also super easy, and it's something that you know this text file is going to be readable no matter what, no matter what happens to software in the future, no matter who has or doesn't have a certain piece of, you know, certain app or database or whatever. Um, so I'm not saying you have to do it that way. It's really just a suggestion to save you time and grief. Um, I've heard stories about people who 
to scan their photos and documents and like, okay, well then I'm done with the original. I'm just gonna, you know, put this on the curb and, and let the let the garbage man take it away. And I'm like, oh well, that's sad. I mean, you can, you're allowed to do that. Um, but uh, I, I personally think that it's really cool to hold in my hand a physical object that's, you know, 50, 100 years old that, that you know, my, my great grandparents made or held. Like, I just think that, that's cool for me. And even if you don't actually care about the physical artifact once it's digitized, your, gen your grandchildren might. So I, I recommend being kind of kind of a pack rat with the physical things, um, even even if only to have them as a backup. So that, that's my opinion. All right, I'm going to move on to the next topic. And that is passwords. So I told you earlier that I have something like a thousand online accounts, and of course, each one of those accounts has a unique password. Now, I'm not going to give you my whole sermon on passwords, although it is Sunday, and um, that is a really good topic for a sermon. Um, but let's just say I, I am strongly in favor of using a different password each site service, making them long, random, and hard to guess. Of course, uh, it's very hard to remember and fill in lots of long, random, different passwords. So you use an app for that. And there are lots of good apps that can do this sort of thing. I like 1Password, personally, uh, but there's also LastPass, there's Dashlane, there's RoboForm. There's like a whole bunch of them. And I don't particularly care which app you use, but find an app that will generate and store and automatically fill in passwords that will save you a lot of grief now. And also it gives you less work later on because what you can basically do is say, hey, digital executor, here's the key. Here's the master password for my password manager. I only have to give you two things, the, the data and the password, and now you have access to all the stuff in it. Um, that's simpler for everyone than trying to pass on a whole bunch of different passwords, especially given that passwords can change over time. Um, now, if you have lots of passwords like I do, you're probably going to want to highlight the ones that are most important because, again, the vast majority of those things nobody is ever going to care about. But it could be useful to someone who is not you to know which are the accounts that this person accesses every day or every week, which are the ones that are attached to really important information or money or whatever. Um, so either make a list of those or if your password manager has labels or folders or categories, you know, assign all those to an important category. Now, um, there are some password managers, and that includes 1Password and LastPass and Dashlane, that, that give you a way to, you know, you, you can actually give someone else live online access to just the particular passwords that you want them to have. That's certainly one way to do it if you want to, like, have, you know, connect up the accounts online. That's cool. Um, if, if you want to go, again, with a low-tech approach, you can just say, well, you know, the, the password vault, this, the actual, like, database that has the passwords in it is on this disk. Here it is. And password is on a piece of paper. So good luck. Um, there, there, there are different approaches. And, again, I don't really care what approach you take. But just make sure one way or another your digital executor will have access to your passwords. Now, um, in this day and age, increasingly, uh, just password isn't enough. So as you may have heard, um, Apple has this new rule that starting uh, in four days, uh, all iCloud users have to turn on two-factor authentication. And if you don't turn it on, it's going to be turned on for you. Um, and uh, this has up until now been optional with iCloud. It's going to be mandatory this week. A lot of other services offer it optionally. I mean, Google does, Microsoft does, Dropbox does, like a whole lot of companies optionally offer this. And basically the idea is just having a username and password is not enough to get into your account. You also need another thing on top of the username and password. And that other thing usually takes the form 
of a numeric code that is sent to your phone or that is generated in an app. And this is a security feature to, to help protect you because the idea is that if somebody steals your passwords from like what, you know, there was a hack or some security breach and the password list gets out, or if somebody guesses your password, um, there's, there's still another way to stop them from stealing your data and stealing your identity because they also have to have, you know, your phone where this message is going to get sent or the, you know, whatever the other tool is that this extra code gets sent to. So that's great. It's, it's a really, it's a little bit of a hassle, but it's a really great and important security feature to prevent your account from getting hacked. But you're in the hospital and your spouse has your password manager, has the master password, they urgently need to get into your whatever insurance account. And they type in the username, they type in the password, and then the, uh, the, the site says, yeah, but I'm also gonna need for you to enter that six digit code that I've just sent to your phone. You're like, hmm, gonna need that phone too. <laughs> Um, so my, my point is that to the extent that you rely on two factor authentication, um, you need to factor that into your planning too. If the codes are sent to your phone, you need to make, or your iPad or some app or whatever the thing is, um, you need to make sure that your digital executor, your spouse or whoever has access to that object and knows how to use it. This is something you have to explain in your digital will. Um, it might not be obvious. Well, of course, you know, my wife's phone is not like turned on and charged and logged in. She's dead. Well, yes, but if I need to get into her accounts, then I better make sure that I can get into her phone too. So um, those are just, I, I hate, sorry, again, I don't mean to be morbid, but it is a thing to think about. Yes, ma'am. I have to say, when I read that, that was an aha moment for me because I read before about not closing all of your accounts because you may need your accounts open in order to get that password. And it, right. was, it was like, ding, you know, you never think of that. So I appreciate you putting that in the book. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier email. I want to want to say a few words about email. Um, uh, email is certainly an area where I'm a pack rat. I have hundreds of thousands of messages, both messages that I've received and messages that I've sent. I mean, you know, email takes up almost no space for per message. Um, and so, and like, I, obviously, I delete spam. I delete, like, you know, click this link to confirm your account, like stupid stuff like that. Things that I know I won't ever need again, I delete those. But almost everything else I keep. And it's really cool because if I have a question about, well, where was I in June of 2004 or, you know, I, whatever, I can look, I can go look at my email. I can find out where I was traveling, what things I was working on, what opinion I had about something that was going on in the world. Uh, you know, like there's, there's a lot of like really useful, interesting historical email, uh, I mean, historical information that's buried in my email. There's also a lot of crap. I mean... Let's, let's be honest, there's a lot of stuff in there that nobody ever, ever, ever will care about. But I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I would pay to, to have, you know, the equivalent of all of the correspondence from my, you know, great grandparents, that would be, that would be gold to me. So, um, <clears throat> so email, for, for me, at least is something that is incredibly worthwhile to preserve. Now, I'm, I'm 50. And um, I, be, be, partly because of my age um, and for how long I've been using email, I've gotten into certain habits um, and certain expectations. And for me, um, email is something that you do in an app, uh, whether that app is Apple Mail or Microsoft Outlook or Thunderbird. Um, I mean, my, I, I, was, I was an emailer person back in the day. Uh, Clara's emailer was I just I just love that app, um, but and and I, I I know that a lot of you are probably fans of Eudora, um, but but that's how that's how I always did email was to have an app, 
Now, I have some friends who are in their 30s, and um, their experience of email is totally different. For, for And they're, they're smart people. They're techie people, too. Like, I'm thinking of, in particular, this couple. The, the man is a, is a programmer, and uh, the woman is, uh, is like an IT administrator for, you know, for, a, for a, 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 a big institution. And so they're highly technical people, but for them, email means Gmail. They, it would never occur to them to go any place other than a web browser to send and receive email. They don't, they don't use an app like Apple Mail. They don't have copies of their messages on their computers and phones. They're all in the cloud. Now, to me, this feels a little weird. It feels a little uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't wanna make a judgment about it like it's bad, good, right, wrong. I'm just saying that is a way that some people do email. And there's a consequence of that which is that if you don't have a local copy of your messages on a device that you own, you, you die and some years go by and somebody wants to access those messages that were only ever in the cloud, well, who knows? What if the place that they were stored goes out of business, loses them, they decide to shut down your account because you haven't used it in years? Like, stuff can go wrong, right? So all I want to say about that is, if even if using a cloud service like Gmail is a beautiful, perfect solution for you today, um, you want to also make sure you have a local copy of your email for the sake of preserving it for posterity. And it's really super easy to do. Uh, basically, you can just set up your account in an app like Apple Mail or Outlook and just let it down download everything and every you know, whatever month or two connect and let it download copies of everything. The, the originals are still in the cloud, so that's fine. You're not deleting them from there. But but just by merely uh, you know connecting, you're going to cache local copies, and I think that's a really good idea. Um, needless to say, you're going to want to make sure that your digital executor has access to your email. And that, that's, that means two things. It means access to those files that you have saved on your disk, but also you want to make sure they can get into your account and actually read and reply to email messages that are being sent. I mean, you're still gonna get email after you're dead. Um, people and companies will not know immediately that you have died. You might want somebody to inform them. <laughs> and also things could happen like you need to reset a password. Well, that link you gotta click is gonna be sent somewhere. Somebody's gotta click that link to get access to your account. Um, there are, you know, like, Utilities, uh, health insurance, life insurance, like all, all, of, all, of, all of the my financial dealings involve some sort of email interaction right now. And I know that's something that somebody else is going to need to have access to, even if only for the sake of like closing down accounts later on. So uh, make sure your digital executor has like, this is my login, this is my username, my password for all my um, email accounts. And of course, you're going to want to tell them what do you want to have done with this stuff? Do you want to have all of my email preserved for all posterity? Do you want to have only some email preserved and please delete these particular mailboxes and don't let anybody read them ever? Um, do you want to shut down all of your email accounts after a month, a year, never? You decide, but write down what you want to have happen to them. Um, want to switch into social media. Now, uh, weirdly enough, like, okay, I, it's just like, I don't know, this is confession time. I don't like or use or really even understand Facebook. Um, my mom, my mom. You got to clap for that, Joe. <laughs> like, look, I have a Facebook account. I maybe grudgingly check it like once a month, but I just, I don't, it's, 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 it's never really worked for me. My mom just turned 80. And she uses Facebook every day. And she can't understand why I, this highly technical person, like, I'm not into Facebook. Like, sorry, mom, like, great that it works for you. It just it doesn't work for me. All right. On the other hand, I use Twitter a lot. And my mom, that, that just, that, you know, does not, it, she cannot wrap her head around Twitter in any way, shape, or form. She would just never, ever use it. So... 
part of it may be just like personality, part of it may be generational, part of it may be I don't know what. Um, there, like I do not use Pinterest, I do not use Instagram, have never used. I don't like for me those aren't things. Um, really, the only form of social media that I that I have pay any attention to is Twitter. But every person is different. There are some people whose entire lives are on Facebook, whose entire lives are on Instagram. And and like I don't I don't want to make you feel bad one way or the other. If you if you use social media or you don't or you use just one kind of a thing and not another, look, it's all good. But what I want to tell you is that you should think about what's going to happen to all that stuff that is on social media after you're gone. Now, if you have used uh, Facebook, I'm just going to take Facebook as an example. If you've, you've, if you if you have used Facebook to, um, you know, post messages, commentary that are really important to you and photographs of important things in your life. And a lot of your interaction with your friends and family members has been on Facebook you might not want that all to just disappear after you're gone. Um, on the other hand, um, I, I have talked to some people who are like, oh, please, when I'm gone, my every the entire history of everything I've said on Twitter must be erased immediately. I really do not want this to persist into the future. So look, I'm just saying, however you use social media, if you use it at all, um, think about what you might want to have happen to that data later on. Might be different for each account. You might say, well, for my Twitter account, I would just like for my next of kin to say, uh, this is a final tweet. Uh, Bob died on you know this date. It's been great. Bye. Okay. Um, maybe you want somebody to like download all of the stuff that you've ever posted on a certain account and just preserve it on, on a computer, on a disk someplace, so that somebody can read it, but maybe not necessarily have it online. Or maybe you do want it to be memorialized online. Now, Facebook, to take, again, just one example, has an option where you can go today to your account, and you can log in and designate someone as a... Hi, my name is Joe Kissel. Oh, Facebook option. That's where we lost you. All right, all right, all right. All right. So, so there is a, there's a Facebook option to designate someone as a legacy contact. So you can actually log into your account right now if you want. Not, I mean, not while I'm talking to you, but later. Um, and <laughs> you can say, I, I authorize the following person to deal with my account after I die. And then once you, if, you know, when that day comes, this person will be authorized to basically post a final message and your account will still be kind of open-ish in the sense that all of your posts will still be there and you can still search them and people can kind of, you know, kind of uh, post their uh, their memories of you or their condolences or like their last things. But other than that, it will be closed to like, you know, new um, new, new people joining, uh, you know, new, new followers and that sort of thing. Um, so it's sort of memorializing your stuff online. Now, um, each social media site has sort of its own options and its own policies. Some are, are more flexible than others. Um, and so, you know, I you know, talk about some of those details in the book. Um, but, uh, but what I want to say today is just, you know, you should, you, you should look into those policies and make decisions about what you would like to have done to each account Later on, which could include, um, you know, wiping everything, downloading it and preserving it offline, you know, preserving it online, final messages or, or what have you. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, that, that large kind of other category of all of your other files, all of your other stuff. And, and we could, you know, we could really talk for quite a long time about it. But one thing I want to talk about is your purchased media. Um, now, um, a friend of mine, uh, uh, died a couple of months ago and shortly before his, he died, his, his wife, um, you know, it was, it, he was, he's been sick for a long time. So it was, it was known it was, it was imminent, but his wife said, so, um, all of the movies that we've bought from iTunes, 
over the years with with his account. I'll just I'll just be able to still access those, right? And I'm like, mm, maybe not necessarily. It's it's a little bit of a weird gray area. So anything that you buy that is copy protected, that is protected by digital rights management or DRM, and that's uh, movies, TV shows, some apps, some songs, depending on where you purchase your music from, uh, some ebooks, depending on where you purchase them from. Anything like that is is sort of a legal gray area when it comes to passing it on because they're like, well, I bought this movie and I have the file on my computer, so why can't I give that to somebody else? Well, part of the part of the answer to that is you didn't really buy the movie. What you really did, as far as the rights owners are concerned, is that you licensed it. You you bought the right to view it, but you didn't buy the right to pass on that right to somebody else. So what this usually means in practice is that in order to view or use that media, someone will have to have your username and password so that your the right to use it can be verified with some server in the cloud someplace. Um, but that can be awkward because like a given device can maybe only be logged in as one person at a time. So maybe they have to log out as them and then log back in as you in order to play your media. And then they want to play something else of their own. So they have to log back out as you and log back in as them. And there, there really is no industry standard for how this is to be dealt with. Uh, of course, the movie and TV studios would, would like to just ignore this and say, yeah, the next generation is going to have to buy their own. Um, but it's weird because you can go out and buy a DVD with a movie on it, and that's something you can hand to somebody else. But you buy a downloadable or streaming version of the same thing, and you can't necessarily do that. Now, I don't really have any great news, like great solutions for you here, except to say it depends. And it's a murky area that's probably going to have to work itself out through like lawsuits and stuff over time. Um but if your plan is to leave your collection of, you know, every Disney movie ever made to your grandkids, I can't guarantee success there. So um, now if it's a movie that you made yourself, fine. If it's something that doesn't have copy protection, then fine. Um, but stuff you purchased is just, it's, it's a gray area. It's hard to, hard to pass on. Um, I don't know if anyone here owns any digital currency, such as Bitcoin or any of the, the other sorts of digital currency that came after that. I don't own any personally. Um, it's just never been of interest to me. But if you do, or if in the future you acquire some, um, that's another one of those things that sort of straddles the line between it's kind of money, but it's also kind of a file or like an important number. <laughs> and so that's something you have to include in your digital will. What do I own? Who gets it? How do they get it? You got to think about all the stuff that's stored in the cloud. Do you have files that are stored only in Dropbox, Google Drive, Amazon Cloud Drive, iCloud? Do you have stuff that is only, you know, backup stored in CrashPlan, Backblaze, whatever, you name it? Um, what data do you have that's in the cloud? And especially, what data do you have that's in the cloud that isn't also someplace else? Um, make a note of what you have how to get into that stuff and uh, and what should be done with it. Because if you have some data that is only stored in, you know, I'm just going to use iCloud as an example. Maybe you're paying the 10 bucks to have two terabytes now of storage, uh, 10 bucks a month to pay the storage, and then you die and you stop paying that $10 a month. Well, that, that stuff that's so stored only in the cloud is going to disappear. So, um, you need to make sure that your digital executor either keeps paying for that storage or more likely downloads that onto a hard drive someplace and, and, uh, and keeps it going. Um, now, a uh, few words about preserving your data. So I already mentioned that, that floppy disks, not, uh, you know, not that easy to use today. And even, even CD-ROMs, not that easy to use. So what do you actually store your data on if you want it to last for a long time? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I'll give you a few, a few options here. 
So there are companies that sell what they call archival quality optical discs. So these are CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray discs that um, instead of using like a, a dye that is that changes color when it's hit by a laser, instead uses a layer of, of some sort of silver or gold uh, compound that uh, that is not subject to degradation over time with heat and humidity and, and and whatever. So that's cool. Some of these companies say, hey, your data that's stored on this CD will last for 100 years. And I say, that is marvelous. Um, I have no idea how somebody 100 years from now is even gonna find a CD reader that works and that they can hook up to their computer because it's really the same, it's the floppy drive problem all over again. The data might be fine, but how am I gonna read it? They're not gonna have CD-ROM readers 100 years from now. So that's, you know, that's maybe a solution for a decade or two, but it's not a super long-term solution. Well, there's there's hard drives, you know, and again, like I use these little little pocket size uh, hard drives for backups and uh, they're pretty cheap. They hold a lot of data. Um, so that's that's an option. I have to tell you that I've had a lot of hard drives die. Um, for me, hard drives tend to last between three and five years and then they just they just die. Um, they're likely to die sooner uh, if I use them heavily and maybe they last longer if I don't, but it's also possible for a hard drive that's barely used at all to, you know, there's a factory defect or whatever. You don't notice it right away, but you put it in a closet, you pull it out a year later and it doesn't work. Uh, SSDs don't have the mechanical issues that hard drives have. On the other hand, they're a lot more expensive than hard drives and they are not impervious to data loss over time. Well, then there's cloud storage. Hey, you know, let's put all of our stuff in Dropbox or Google Drive or wherever, and it's just gonna be stored on some hard drive in a huge data center, and they're gonna have their own backups, and like if a, if a hard drive starts wearing out, they'll replace it, and the, the, you know, you can keep stuff, <clears throat> keep stuff alive in the cloud for a really long time because other people are worrying about the maintenance. That's true. Of course, as I said, um, if, if you are storing more than, more than the amount that you can get for free, uh, somebody's gonna have to keep paying for that cloud storage once you're gone. And by the way, um, we, we look at these big companies like Google and Amazon and Apple and say, well, they're gonna be around forever, but we don't really know that. We don't really know that these companies will all be around 50 or 100 years from now. A lot of things can change in that period of time. If a company goes out of business or just decides to <clears throat> move into a different area, um, what happens to your cloud storage? Well, you can print out stuff. Paper uh, lasts for a long time. Hey, we've you know museums have books that are thousands of years old. We know how to preserve paper. Um, and that might be an option for some of your stuff. It's really not gonna help very much for your movies, um, you know, and your audio recordings and things like that could be useful for some stuff. Then there's a company that, that makes these, they look they look almost like like CDs, except they don't have a hole in them, but they're these, these discs that are made out of sapphire. And they are so strong and so indestructible, they claim, the company claims you can drop them in lava and they will still, you know, be okay. And instead of like recording stuff digitally, they actually take a laser and and they, they basically burn stuff into this disc, they etch it. So you don't put this into a computer to read it. The way you read it is get a really good magnifying glass. And you, you just like, it's so it's basically like, instead of printing out on paper, they print out really, really small, really, really small, on this sapphire disc. And so the company's claim is this: these discs are waterproof, they are fireproof, they are impervious to magnetic fields. And you don't have to worry about file formats cause all you need is a magnifying glass and they're always gonna have magnifying glasses in the future. So if you wanna preserve your stuff forever, you put them on these sapphire discs. So that's cool. Uh, one disc that will hold you know, several hundred pages is gonna cost about $1,300 about $1,300. Okay. And uh, that's, 
that's expensive. <laughs> and if that one disc is, you know, lost or stolen, then that's a problem. So, so my point is, there are a lot of options and none of them are perfect. They all have a downside. Hard disks have a downside. Cheap, you know, archival quality CDs have a downside. Sapphire disks have a downside. Paper has a downside. There literally isn't any technology available today that has no downside. So I have two recommendations. The first recommendation is just like, you know, your stock broker will tell you about your portfolio, diversify. Use more than one different storage medium. And not only that, but tell your kids, grandkids, digital executor every so often, every five years or 10 years, why don't you like get a new one of these things, whatever the, the current technology is at that point in the future, and recopy it onto the new thing because the old thing might not last. So that's recommendation number one. Uh, recommendation two is you, again, you go to your kids and you say, son, how much do you love me? And, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's really like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a son and a parent. And that's, that's a really hard thing to, to, to weasel out of, you know, if a parent starts that way, like more than anything, dad, you know, and, and so, you know, you want to say, do you love me enough to, to, to donate to your dear old dad, uh, a little corner of your hard drive on your on your Mac that will hold my archive of stuff, my digital photos, my documents, my email. I just want you to stick them in a folder on your hard drive, and they're going to take up you know number of tens of gigabytes of space. But you don't have to use them. You don't have to do anything. Just have them there. They will be backed up along with the rest of your stuff. And as you move from one computer to the next to the next, that's going to come with it, and the backups will come with it. And because they are sort of kept alive on a computer and they're still backed up, uh, they're going to be preserved for a lot longer than if it's just a hard drive sitting in a closet. And then maybe your son or daughter says to their son or daughter, how much do you love me? And, and it kind of gets passed on that way. So you should do that. But whether you do that or not, um, you should also pick, you know, it's going to be like whatever it's going to for you it might be a thumb drive and a cd for somebody else it might be a hard drive and a big stack of paper but whatever it is you choose your couple couple of storage media you copy onto that all the stuff you want to preserve it's your photos your email your documents your stuff you put it on there uh again you need to have at least two different copies of this preferably in different formats you're going to keep them in different places um, and while you are still alive, you want to make sure every few years, so you go back and refresh that because meanwhile, you're still taking new photographs, you're still receiving new email messages, and you want to make sure that those are added to those archives. Um, in addition to doing that, you want to make sure that your actual physical computer, iPad, phone, whatever, uh, are also left to an heir. Um, and that they know how to get at the information on your computer. Because despite these archives that you're going to carefully preserve, it's still going to be easiest and most convenient to get at your data when it's on the computer that you use every day. So you've done this. You have your, your disk or your flash drive or whatever the thing is. And I want you to make a little file folder, a little dossier for yourself. It's going to include that. It's going to include a paper copy of your regular will. It's going to include a paper copy of your digital will. Remember that one that has a list of all of your digital assets and what you, what you want to have done with them, the one you've been filling out with this template. It's going to have instructions for your digital executor, what to do with all of this stuff. And it's also going to have a little document that I call how to be me. So the point of this, and again, this is one of those things that will be useful in the future, but also useful if you go on vacation, useful if you're laid up in the hospital. It's basically how to do the stuff that only you know how to do. And this could be stuff like around the house. Well, you know, every fall I have to like clean out the gutters and I have to do this certain thing with the thing. Otherwise, we're going to have a leak. Uh, every, you know, 5,000 miles, this and this and this has to be done with the car. Um, every 
other Saturday, I have to pay the gardener to do this thing. Like, there's a lot of stuff just around, you know, managing your household that that we all just know that we haven't, like, written down those instructions for anyone else to do. If you run a business, it's the same thing. You know, people have to get paid. Uh, paperwork has to be filed. Stuff has to be done. And as long as you're alive and healthy, it's fine for you to just remember to do those things. But if you are unavailable to do them, um, it's really important to write down at least high-level instructions so that somebody who isn't you can do those things. Um, so what I mean by this how to be me document is basic. It's not, you know, it doesn't need to be a book. It doesn't need to be pages and pages of great detail, but it needs to be at least a list, high-level overview of the things that need to be done to sort of keep your household and your business going that you only currently have in your head. Another fun thing to do is to write your own obituary. Uh, people call these autobituaries. Um, and the reason you want to do this is that if you've ever read an obituary, they're usually pretty dry. And um, I have read obituaries of people that I've known. I'm like, really? Actually, that's not the Uncle Bill that I knew. <laughs> you know, um, because what happens is the obituaries are, are written after someone has died, people are grieving, they're overwhelmed, they're busy, and somebody like a newspaper editor or a funeral director is going to be like, you know, look, just fill in this form. It's like Mad Libs, you know, this person was, is, you know, had this occupation, was born on this date, is survived by so-and-so. And so they do that because it's easy. But then it's not really the representation of that person that they would have liked. And it might not even be accurate. <clears throat> But you know who can write a great obituary of, of you is, is you. So if you Google this and, and read obituaries that people have written about themselves, they're often really hilarious. Um, but they also have a lot of soul and a lot of characters. Like, that's great. That's the way I wanted to remember that person. Um, you can say what you want to say about your accomplishments or what's important to you. And you just say, hey, look, uh, when I'm gone, you can fill in the date and the cause of death. Otherwise, this is what I want to have published in the newspaper, okay? Um, and I think that's a really great idea. And along with that, if there are any um, you know, genealogical uh, details that you know or biographical things about other uh, you know, friends, family members that you want to include, put that in that, that paper archive too. And put that in a safe place, maybe a safe deposit box or a safe in your house or wherever, someplace that, that, that will be protected. And um, this collection of stuff is going to be one representation of your digital legacy that you want to preserve and pass on and make sure it gets, you know, copied and taken care of um, by, by other people. So um, that, uh, I think, went a little bit longer than I was planning. And I apologize for the technical interruptions, but that's sort of a quick spin through the Digital Legacy book, and you have the papers that tell you how to get books and uh, where, to, you know, the, the discount and so forth. Um, so I, I hope that uh, you'll take advantage of that. But I would like to know if there are any other questions. Are there any? Well, while, while we're thinking of questions, I want to mention uh, at least one thing, um, how to be me. Yeah. I have, uh, my husband is, he's very capable. He's just computer illiterate and he wants to stay that way. Yeah. yeah. And he has no qualms with, the only time he's sitting at a computer is when he's sitting next to me. Otherwise, he avoids them like a plague. Um, the only reason he got an iPhone was so that he could text me while we were dating. Other, other than that, he would not have one. Okay? All right. All right. So, All right. that how to be me document forced me to force him to really take stock on what's on my computer because our lives are on my computer. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and he would not even know how to get in there and know what to do. He's always asking me, well, what's next? What's next? And just trying and making sure that he knew, um, you know, your book really forced me to do that. And now at least he has a clue. Everything yeah, yeah. you want to know is right here, honey. So appreciate it. Uh, 
I, I am sorry that your husband has that defect. Um, uh, but, but I think we all know people like that, right? And um, sometimes the best you can do is say, now look, when I'm gone, here is the person who knows how to get at all this other stuff. And it's it's too bad that that person can't be your spouse, but but I have I have put the um, you know the 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 digital information that you might need to know in this other person's hands, and they can walk you through it if you need it. And and I, we've already designated that person. He doesn't want to talk That's about it, but honey, we got to. Right. Yep, yep, right. yep. Are there? Hold on, we do have a question for you, Joe. Uh, the question is, he uses Thunderbird for his email, and he wants to yeah, know, yeah. if you save all of your emails, do you worry about it being bogged down from the volume? Um, provisionally, no. <coughs> um, most people these days use IMAP. Um, as opposed to pop. And if you use IMAP, then what happens is the email server keeps a master copy of the messages and your client like Thunderbird uh, keeps a local copy. If you delete something locally, it gets deleted off the server. If you delete, you know, connect with multiple computers, you delete with one, it gets deleted off the server, then it gets, gets deleted off the other. What I've noticed with IMAP is that it doesn't like having huge numbers of messages in your inbox. Uh, now I have some, some mailboxes that have like tens of thousands of messages and those are generally fine. Um, but I have found that with apps like Apple Mail and Thunderbird, um, your, your, your computer and the, the app really can bog down if you have thousands or tens of thousands of messages in your inbox. Now, personally, I, I feel that an inbox ought to be treated like an inbox, which is to say, this is for incoming stuff. And once I've dealt with it, I, I move it someplace else. Um, so as long as you do that, then you shouldn't have a problem. But if you don't think about email that way, if you think, oh, yeah, well, just I just keep everything in my inbox. I, I read a message and then I don't move it anywhere. Um, your inbox is a place that if there are if there are too many messages in it, it really can bog down. So So my suggestion is... Just have have another folder someplace. Have another mailbox that you you drag stuff when you're done with it. Okay, we have no more questions. Things are going right on time. Joe, thank you so much for. Yay! We can't hear you. It's a real pleasure. I, I, I appreciate everyone's forbearance with the technology, um, but it was uh, it was a real pleasure and honor to be here, and uh, I hope I get to. Uh, get to talk to you guys again sometime. I hope so too, Joe. I would love to have you back talking about some of your other Take Control books. They're very fascinating. Thank you. There are quite a few of them. All right. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, Joe. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.